Welcome to the Environmental Health and Safety Virtual Classroom. I'm your instructor, Derek Dene, an environmental consultant and industrial hygienist with over 27 years experience in the recognition, evaluation, prevention, and control of hazards in the built environment. In our session, we're going to discuss Airborne Infection Isolation Rooms, or AIIRs. Quarantine and isolation. These are both strategies to reduce the spread of a contagious disease, but they're different. Quarantine restricts the movement of people who've been exposed to a contagious disease to wait and see if they develop the illness over time. For things like COVID-19, quarantined individuals are often referred to as COVID status unknown. Isolation, on the other hand, separates someone who has contracted a contagious disease from others. For COVID-19, for example, isolated individuals are often called COVID positive or COVID confirmed via testing or COVID presumed via their symptomology they exhibit. Sending employees home is an option. Employees can be sent home to quarantine or isolate for a prescribed amount of time before returning to the workplace. Consideration should be given to removal of non-employee occupants from the site, but residents in your vulnerable population, such as skilled nursing facilities, prisons, hospitals, etc., may not be able to be relocated or removed from your facility. Since sending residents away may not be an option, they may need to be sheltered on site. Airborne infection isolation rooms, or AIIRs, are an important strategy in the quarantine or isolation of individuals at your facility, depending upon what disease they might have, depending upon if they're positive or presumed positive or under quarantine. So how do we get exposure in a facility? Well, it depends on the pathogen, and it depends on your facility, and it depends on your population. But a general rule of thumb is, in order for someone to get sick from an environmental hazard, chemical, biological, radiological, you have to have a pollutant, you have to have a pathway, and you have to have a receptor. Without a pollutant, even if there's a way for things to get from point A to point B, and a population who may be receptive to that uh, hazard, it's no problem because there's no pollutant. If you have a pollutant, but there's no way for it to reach your receptor, it's no problem. And of course, if you have no receptor, you can have a pollutant and a pathway, but no one will become injured or infected. So the transmission of infectious agents within a healthcare setting requires three elements. A source or reservoir of the infectious agents. That's your pollutant. A mode of transmission for that agent to go from infected individuals to healthy individuals. That's your pathway. And then of course you need a susceptible host. That is your receptor. For SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes the disease, COVID-19, infections can be transmitted when an infected person exhales or coughs or emits droplets or very small particles containing one or more viron. If droplets and particulates containing the complete infective form of a virus, the core, of RNA or DNA in a capsid are outside of a host cell and emitted into the environment, those infectious agents can be inhaled by other people. They can land directly on other people in their eyes, in their nose, their mouth, or they can contaminate surfaces and therefore other people can touch those. We call surfaces that can transmit pathogens or agents of disease fomites. The United States Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or CDC, provides guidance in many topics relevant to infectious disease. For example, the COVID-19 pandemic. The CDC offers a guideline called the 2007 Guideline for Isolation Precautions, Preventing Transmission of Infectious Agents in Healthcare Settings, which was last updated in around 2019 by the CDC Healthcare Infection Control Practices Advisory Committee. Appendix A to the CDC guideline for isolation precautions delineates the type and duration of precautions recommended for selected infections and conditions. For example, SARS or severe acute respiratory syndrome. Infection and condition are considered, types and precautions are considered, duration of those precautions, and commentary. For SARS, you have airborne precautions, 
droplet precautions, contact precautions, and your standard infection control precautions. The duration of the precaution depends on the illness. So for SARS, it would be the duration of the illness plus 10 days after the resolution of symptoms such as fever or respiratory symptoms. Use airborne precautions as recommended in Appendix A for patients known or suspected to be infected with an infectious agent transmittable from person to person by the airborne route. Examples of this might include SARS-CoV-2, which is the agent that causes COVID-19, or tuberculosis, or measles, or chickenpox. In acute care hospitals and long-term care settings, place patients who require airborne precautions in airborne infection isolation rooms, or AIIRs, that have been constructed in accordance with current accepted guidelines. Specific guidelines include the CDC guidelines for environmental infection control in healthcare facilities, the CDC guidelines for preventing the transmission of mycobacterium tuberculosis in healthcare settings, and the American Institute of Architects guidelines for design and construction of hospital and healthcare facilities. I've been using the term airborne infection isolation room, which may give you the impression that this is just one room. And it can be just one room, but keep in mind that sometimes you may need multiple rooms, which might make an airborne infection isolation wing, or you may have an entire structure dedicated to the isolation of infected individuals, which you might call an airborne infection isolation building. Regardless of the scenario, airborne infection isolation areas are specifically designed to disrupt the transmission of pathogens from patients to staff, from patient to patient, and from patients and staff to people in the outside world. This is accomplished in a variety of ways. For example, established standard operating procedures, or SOPs, including personal hygiene practices and personal protective equipment to directly protect personnel from infection. Reduce the accumulation of pathogenic particles in all spaces. Establish engineering controls that create a directional gradient of pathogenic particle concentrations, where the highest expected concentration is nearest the pathogen source. Designate specific areas within your isolation area. You will have a contaminated area. You may refer to that as your hot zone. You'll have a decontamination area or a transitional space, which is often referred to as a warm zone. And then you'll have areas that are uncontaminated, which are often referred to as cold zones. Establish a flow of personnel and materials between transitional spaces to reduce exposure potential and to allow for easy decontamination. I'd now like to provide you with a brief overview of what an airborne infection isolation room might entail. Each patient room should be set up as an airborne infection isolation room. You may also have known these in the past as negative pressure isolation rooms. But these rooms are single occupancy patient care rooms, for example, used to isolate people with a suspected or confirmed airborne infectious disease. Groups of these AIIRs can exist adjacent to one another and create airborne infection isolation wings. Environmental factors such as airflow are controlled in these AIIRs to minimize the transmission of infectious agents that are usually transmitted from person to person by droplet nuclei associated with coughing or aerosolization of contaminated fluids. In brief, airborne infection isolation rooms should maintain a negative pressure in the room so that contaminated air is not recirculated throughout the entire isolation area or allowed to go into other zones, such as your cold zone. But how much negative pressure do you need? How many air changes per hour, or ACH, are required? Well, according to the CDC, air change rates of at least six air changes per hour are required for existing structures that are gonna be modified to become airborne infection isolation rooms. 12 air changes per hour are required by the CDC for new construction or new renovation and these air change per hour rates must be maintained. So they should not be your target. Your target should be higher than this because air changes per hour will drop as filters become saturated. So you may set a target of eight air changes per hour in existing structures 
or perhaps 14 air changes an hour as a target in your new construction or new renovation so that you can maintain that six air change rate or that 12 air change per hour rate that is required for your facility. So if you're establishing an airborne infection isolation room in an existing building, you may want to use temporary hard barriers or temporary soft barriers. So I'm going to show you a quick example of a temporary soft barrier installation. You don't want to have them up all the time in many cases. You want to have enough preparation though that you can set these things up in a jiffy. Mm -hmm. So we prep the door by putting Velcro or hook and loop on the door frame in the anticipation that we may need to install a barrier, a soft barrier between two functional spaces. Then you can come in easily later and install your flexible door panels, which will help to maintain two things. One, it prevents the flow of air from this room to that room, or that room to this room. The other thing is it allows for a negative pressure. So if we have a, a pressurization or depressurization, this allows that pressure to be held. But what's nice about things like this, they make, they make zippered versions, but I really like this one because you can open them up and close them because they're magnetized. They'll self-close. This is good for the pass-through of an individual. If you wanted to pass through a gurney or other larger objects, you would just install one of these magnetic closure devices on either side of the door so that you could then choose to roll it up or push a gurney straight through. Airborne infection isolation rooms should direct their exhaust air from the room to outside of the building or through a recirculation system that runs through a HEPA filter before returning to circulation. Airborne infection isolation rooms should be set up to accommodate groupings of patients infected or colonized with the same agent. We call this cohorting, bringing them together to confine their care to one area, to make their care easier, and to prevent contact with uninfected, susceptible patients. Medical and other support staff should be isolated in a positively pressurized area adjacent to isolation areas, but separated by an anteroom. For example, your cold zone should be positively pressurized in comparison to your warm zone. Your warm zone should be positively pressurized compared to your hot zone. This will allow air to flow from cold to warm to hot. The required airflow pattern is one where air flows from the medical support staff area or cold zone through the anteroom or warm zone and into the isolation area or hot zone. And this is achieved by air handling equipment, exhausting air from the building to depressurize certain area, HEPA filtering air in other areas, or pressurizing other areas with filtered air. With the establishment of a COVID-19 wing, you're normally retrofitting or adapting a building that's constructed for some other purpose. These modifications may require you to consider your HVAC, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning system. For example, some air conditioning vents may be located on one side of a zone, your cold or warm zone, or another side of a zone, your warm or hot zone. Having your HVAC system split around what we call critical barriers can be problematic and interfere with pressure differentials or distribute infectious agents to places where you don't want them to be distributed. Consider your HVAC system before you install any barriers, hard or soft, permanent or temporary. Establishing an AIIR may require blocking of HVAC inlets or outlets, or adjusting the position of zones or dampers as necessary. Consider also that pressure differentials may shift as HVAC activities shift as units cycle on or off, building pressures may change, airflow may change. These must be considered in your design. For this reason, pressure differentials should be monitored during the various states of HVAC system use to ensure that proper airflow is maintained under all activity combinations, regardless of thermostat demand, regardless of the season, time of day, energy management system use, etc. 
We've talked about pressure differentials, but we really haven't delved into the weeds. Let's dig a little deeper. We want to maintain a pressure of at least negative 0.1 inches of water column at the entryway to each isolation room at all times. So just as with our air changes per hour, where we were targeting either six in existing building or 12 air changes per hour in new builds, we want to target 0.1 inches of water at the entry to each isolation room, which means if we have to maintain that pressure, we need to have a goal that is even higher or greater negative pressure at that room. How do you know you're maintaining 0.1 inches of negative pressure on the water column at each of your isolation rooms? Well, you're gonna to need to monitor that. How do we do that? Let's talk about it. In order to verify continuous pressure differentials, you should install some sort of visual verification method. For example, smoke tubes or flutter strips at the entrance to each isolation room. It could be as simple as hanging a thin sheet of plastic from the doorway so that you can actually visually confirm that air is moving from an area of less contamination into the areas of presumed greater contamination, thereby de demonstrating or proving a negative pressure is being maintained. But that's qualitative. That's a yes or no. Is the room under negative pressure or is it not? You'll also want to verify quantitatively or numerically that your desired pressure of at least 0.1 inches on the water column is maintained for each isolation room. How do you do this? Well, you can install a stationary pressure differential sensing device, PDS, or you can deploy a handheld pressure differential monitor. These are called manometers and they're very common. You can have stationary manometers, handheld manometers that you would bring out on a regular basis and screen multiple rooms or multiple areas. When you're verifying your continuous pressure differentials, you want to record the results, whether you have a manual device or an automatic device. And this record keeping needs to be in line with your standard operating procedures. The sophistication of stationary equipment is becoming more and more advanced. We now have data logging manometers with digital readouts, Many of them can communicate to you directly, even send a text to your phone to tell you that you're approaching a level of concern or that an exceedance has occurred. Regardless of the device you choose, you wanna make sure you are recording the pressure differentials. Let's talk about filtration. Isolation room air or contaminated air can be exhausted, but whether it's exhausted or recirculated, it needs to be HEPA filtered. HEPA filtration is sort of the highest level of filtration we have available. High efficiency particulate air or high efficiency particulate arrestants. It removes particles at the 0.3 micron size, which is the most difficult particle to capture with a 99.97% efficiency. And it captures things bigger than 0.3 microns more efficiently and smaller than 0.3 microns more efficiently. So whether you're exhausting or recirculating, you wanna make sure you have HEPA filtration on your system. Any HEPA filtration device or AFD that's in recirculating mode or exhaust mode should be located within the area and maintain continuous operation. When you're powering these devices down, you need to consider that the filter may be loaded with infectious agents. And so you'll need to cover the inlet to these devices with an airtight barrier such as plastic sheeting. This will also prevent backdrafting or dust off if you have an exhaust tube that goes to the outdoors and there are pressure differentials between the outdoors and the interior of your building. We want to keep the infectious agents that have been captured on that filter on that filter and not re-entrain them into the environment. HEPA filtered air filtration devices can be placed inside the isolation room or outdoors. These devices can be placed one per isolation room or there can be one device with a manifold that serves multiple rooms. Your design is gonna depend on your unique facility situation. If you locate the air filtration device inside the building, it reduces the likelihood of theft or vandalism. It reduces the impact of weather on these devices, but it increases the complexity of servicing these units because you may have to send technicians into isolation rooms where there are patients who are infirm. It also increases the noise exposure to the patient, which may be a comfort issue for your resident. Locating the air filtration devices outside of the building 
increases the likelihood of theft or vandalism and increases the impact on weather, but decreases the complexity of servicing these units and decreases the noise exposure to the patient. Let's talk about source control. If you're trying to control something that is hazardous, it's best to control it at the source, at the location where it's being emitted. You don't want to wait till it's been aerosolized and made its way across your facility to try to filter something out or capture something. You want to capture it at the source. So ideally, you'll locate inlets to your filtration or inlets to your exhaust equipment near the breathing area of the patient. You may even have the inlet above the patient's head or near the patient's head. You may even isolate the patient inside a bubble. There are many strategies to achieve this mission, but you have to pick the strategy that's best for your situation. You can affix or suspend an inlet directly above your occupants, and that inlet could be flexible or rigid. It can be large or small. There's a variety of ways, but you find a way for your facility that is practical and also comfortable for the patient. Ideally, this duct inlet can be maneuverable, so you have a degree of flexibility to allow for patient comfort and bed adjustments. Makeshift hoods, tents, or other means of limiting the spread of shed viral particles can be integrated into the inlet system. There are many safety considerations when establishing an AIIR, including trip hazards, fire safety, etc. Also, perception is an issue. HEPA filtered exhaust, although it should be clean and have no or negligible infectious particles in it, should not be allowed to outlet near people. One, it's a bad idea because your HEPA filter may fail or the HEPA system may fail. So you always wanna keep your HEPA filtered exhaust at least six feet away from any people who might come into contact or walk past that exhaust. Generally, you would run them outside of the building and up to the roof so that that air is exhausted into the atmosphere and not blowing onto passerbys. In the event of a HEPA filtration failure, you want to ensure that the HEPA filtered exhaust is away from people, away from roads, away from sidewalks, any paths of travel, or away from any outdoor air inlets for your HVAC system. These airborne infection isolation rooms, when they are designed and built, are robust. But what about if you're taking an existing building and installing or modifying it to be an airborne infection isolation room. How temporary is this setup? Is this going to be a day, a week, a month, a year? I recommend that you put robust components in your system so that if you think it's gonna last a week, you design it to last three months. If you think it needs to last three months, design it to last a year. My experience is often these systems are in place for an extended period of time well beyond the design lifetime. Don't save a dollar only to have to replace the entire system in three months because you know it's gonna to have to be in place for a year. Consider things like abrasion, ultraviolet light, weather events, wind, heat, etc. There are tough components available. Make sure you pick the right component for your facility. Ensure that your exhaust ducting is well secured, whether it's flexible or rigid. Wind events come without warning in many cases and can significantly damage your airborne infection isolation room, which is not really that difficult to repair unless there are patients quarantined or isolated in those rooms. Then the level of repair becomes astronomically more complex. Build it right the first time, secure it so that heavy weather events don't work against you. Based on our discussions so far, airborne infection isolation rooms have a level of complexity in their design, in their installation, and in their operation. Keep in mind that there are jurisdictional considerations. Your local regulations uh, should dictate how you design, how you implement, and how you maintain your airborne infection isolation rooms. For example, in states like California, OSHPOD may need to have direct input or approval on your airborne infection isolation room. Or a local fire department may have something to say about the way that you've modified your building. You may have to change your emergency operations plan because you're changing the way that your building has access to egress or any other life safety considerations. 
let's talk a little bit about climate control. We've been discussing infection control, which is the mission, but infection control without comfort may be problematic. HVAC systems, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning systems that serve your isolation areas, that serve your warm zones or your cold zones, should be capable of maintaining comfortable temperatures. In your isolation areas, you should have HEPA filtration and be capable of maintaining a temperature differential of 20 degrees Fahrenheit between the indoor air and the outdoor air. The HVAC system within your isolation area should have the capability of maintaining a two degree Fahrenheit difference between locations within that isolation area. If possible, outdoor air should be prioritized over recirculated air within the limits of the system's ability to maintain a comfortable temperature. 100% outside air would be ideal, but your HVAC system may be unable to provide a comfortable temperature for your occupants or may be unable to control humidity in jurisdictions like Florida or East Texas where the outdoor humidity is so high that if you brought in 100% outside air, you would end up with condensation on all surfaces. Keep in mind that increasing outdoor air, especially during summer months or winter months, will result in an energy penalty. Energy should not be your priority when it comes to airborne infection isolation. But just make accommodations that your energy bill will probably increase if you set up a system of this nature. There are some tricks to reducing the energy demand. If you have an airborne infection isolation wing with 10 rooms, and only one room is occupied, you may be able to design that system so that you're only bringing outside air to the individual room and not having to cool, heat, or otherwise ventilate those other rooms at the same rate. This will depend on your facility and your design. For this reason and many others, you're going to need to bring in an HVAC professional to determine if the increased stress on your system can be accommodated with your in-house equipment or if you're going to need to bring in external equipment to accommodate these climate demands. Interim life safety measures have to be considered. Modifying your fire life safety access and egress routes, changing your emergency operations plan, compromising access to fire protection features such as pull stations, modifying signage, or perhaps conducting training that's specific to your airborne infection isolation wing. It takes a team. Every building is unique. Every pathogen is different. Every population is distinctive. It's beyond the scope of this session to thoroughly detail all the operational procedures and protocols for an isolation wing at your site. But you're gonna to need to consider professional team members. Assemble an AIIR task force to include internal and external resources. Internal resources like administrators, clinicians, environmental services, facility engineering, health and dietary professionals, or external professionals such as an industrial hygienist, fire life and safety consultants, HVAC contractors, or an environmental remediation firm. We've demonstrated that airborne infection isolation rooms have a level of complexity and that may be intimidating to some, but keep in mind that there are guidelines available for you to read there are internal resources for you to use. There are external resources for you to use. Your success in developing and executing an airborne infection isolation room is critical to the health and safety of your staff and critical to the health and safety of your residents.